This is Think Tech Hawaii. Community matters here. Aloha. Welcome to Adventures in Small Business, a collaboration between the United States Small Business Administration Hawaii District Office and its resource partners, where we showcase Hawaii's entrepreneurs and small businesses. Uh, my name is Dennis Kwok. I'm the director of the Veterans Business Outreach Center. And today we have a good friend and uh, a, a resource partner as well, uh, John Green from the Hawaii Procurement Technical Assistance Center. Welcome to the show, John. Well, first off, uh, thank you very much for having me on the show. I right. certainly appreciate the, the opportunity to be here. Yeah. Uh, you know, I always see John around uh, in uh, workshops, and I always see him around town. And I know the work you do is uh, tremendously valuable for small business owners. Uh, but actually, before we start talking about the Procurement Technical Assistance Center, uh, you being a veteran, uh -huh. um, uh, uh, could you talk a little bit about your military service, how it started, and how you ended up here in Hawaii? Certainly. Uh, and, and thank you for letting me share my story a little yeah. bit. No, please. Um, first off, I was born and raised in Boston, and I went to school in Colorado, and I joined the Navy while I was in Colorado. Okay. Uh, the Navy, in their, their good fortune, I guess, they sent me to here to Hawaii in 1994, and I served on a submarine out at Pearl Harbor, the USS Kamehameha good Hawaiian I submarine know. that I served on. Uh, did four years of active duty, uh, went back to school, finished my education, came back to Hawaii, joined the reserves in 1998. Uh, have been in the reserves ever since, so I'm still in the reserves, still a drilling reservist. Uh, been deployed a couple times uh, to the Middle East, uh, always an interesting adventure over mm -hmm. there. Uh, but in the entire time I've been uh, serving in the military, it's always focused around logistics, supply, contracting, uh, stuff like that, either here or overseas. Okay. You know. So I guess it was a kind of a sm smooth transition from your work you've done in the military to the work that you do now for PTAC? Yeah, I'd say it's a, a definitely been a, a smooth transition, and I think it's allowed me to help businesses get a focus on the government's perspective. Right. Having worked from that side for a long time, I can kind of put into words what the government expects from their small businesses when they do contracting and procurement, stuff like that. Right. Um, so for those of the, that are joining that don't really understand what PTAC does, maybe sure. you can talk a little bit about uh, the mission of PTAC, Hawaii PTAC, as well as what kind of services you guys provide. Absolutely. The technical Absolutely. Assistance. Yeah. Thank you for letting me do that. And I, yeah. I think the, the PTAC provides a really valuable service to the small businesses here in Hawaii, especially those who want to pursue government contracting. Whether it's federal, state, or county contracting, we can provide some form of assistance. So the local PTAC is a member of the National APTAC organization, the Association of Procurement Technical Assistance Centers. And there's approximately 170 of these centers across the country, mm -hmm. uh, we being the one for the state of Hawaii. We have a counselor uh, on Maui, and we have another one in Hilo, as well as myself here in Honolulu. So we're a nonprofit. We're funded in part by the Office of Hawaiian Affairs okay. and the Defense Logistics Agency, who also provides us a grant. Um, the services we provide kind of vary depending upon the needs of the, the client that we're servicing. Uh, a new business who's just getting familiar with government contracting, we may help them with the registration process, mm -hmm. uh, getting their you know, required documents, required certifications in, okay. prior to actually competing for any kind of contracts that the government has. And that's more on the federal side. The state may not be as stringent as far as registration is concerned, although you do have to register with the state. Um, so we sit them with the registration if they want to certify themselves as like a woman-owned small business or a service-able veteran-owned small business. We can assist with that process as well. Uh, we help them market themselves to the government as well as prime contractors if they're going to pursue subcontracts. Mm -hmm. uh, we help them put together a proposal, always with the little caveat that we're not the expert in their field. They are. Right. So we can review it for completeness, but never with the understanding that, that we're going to suggest what they should do to meet the government's requirements. Okay. So, and then we offer uh, a bid match service mm -hmm. to our clients who are competing for contracts. And right. what the bid match service does is it looks at all the opportunity sites on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. So be it the federal sites, the state sites, county sites, however the government is looking for vendors to provide some kind of service for them. Right. So typically a small business can take hours looking at these sites, hoping that there's something there for them. And mm -hmm. may, they may or may, may or may not find something. So this bid match program kind of takes that place. And if something matches our clients, they'll get an email with it 
And they so can it's an autom automated. Right, it's an automated system that looks at these sites every single day on their behalf. Okay. Um, all the services we provide, including the bid match service, are free. You know, and I think that's important to realize is that the services we offer are free. Right. Because there are other organizations out there that will charge for the same type of services that we provide. Yeah. So, um, so you said a lot, especially yeah. on the services, and yeah. it's actually great. But uh, I think maybe with stepping back, I think maybe the viewers who aren't kind of uh, advert, I mean, uh, don't know the knowledge of uh, government contracting, mm -hmm. maybe you can explain, you know, what government contracting is. Sure. What, what, what is that? What, sure. what is that? Sure. So. If you're the government and you have a requirement, you have something that you need, be it something that broke or something that you're installing or something that's new that's come along. So in order to get that need met, there's certain ways the government procures or buys what it is they need. Right. They can do it on a credit card. They can do it on a, you know, what's called a federal supply schedule. They can do it on a, a full-blown contract. Mm -hmm. So it varies depending upon the dollar amount that the government's looking for. Typically, smaller amounts are done on a credit card. Uh, larger amounts are done on contracts. Right. So contracts are a little bit more complicated than you know, credit card purchases. So in order to understand it, there's a lot of federal acquisition regulations that go into it, yeah. and they govern government contracting. So and that's where a lot of businesses can be kind of confused a little bit by right. the just the, the volume of regulations that are involved with that. So we kind of help them understand what the applicable regulations mean. Mm -hmm. um, so contracting is just one way the government kind of meets their own requirement, Okay. what their needs are. Yeah, and the government, I mean, the United States government anyways, is the mm -hmm. biggest purchasers of uh, small business goods and services. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. And the biggest purchaser within the government is the Department of Defense, which right. has a yeah. huge presence here on Oahu in, right. in, in our islands. Yeah, so. it does. Um, so um, who is eligible for this government contracting? Typically, it's it's... Any business can be eligible for government contracting because um, the government procures anything from janitorial services to, you know, space exploration. Right. So anything in between there. So you could you could think of it as you may not think that you do something that the government is going to require, mm -hmm. but you never know. Right. The government can procure from, like I said, from janitorial services to aircraft carriers to fighter jets to, you know, security services. So it depends on the business. Okay. Um, the only requirement is that they actually register to okay. do work for the government. When you say register, register with the federal government or what? Right. Okay. So the federal government has a process in place. First, you have to obtain what's called a DUMS number, okay. and then you actually register with the federal government mm -hmm. in another system called the System for Word Management. Right. Again, another process that we can provide assistance with. So, okay. Um, so you navigate, yeah. you help them navigate the water. Does it right. take a lot of one-on-one -on -one time with the client? It can, okay. depending upon how comfortable they are doing it themselves. We have a lot of clients that are a little bit more comfortable on a computer and navigating it themselves. And then we have those clients who feel more comfortable coming into our office and having us provide that one-on-one -on -one assistance with them. Okay. Um, and we're more, more than welcome, more than happy to do that for them, so, sure. yeah. So, um, you know, you've been doing this for how long, uh, being the program manager? I've been the that? program manager for six years. Okay, for six yeah. years. Um, and in your experience, have you seen certain kinds of industries do better than other industries in, in terms of uh, procurement or federal contracting? Or it's, you're always going to find those industries that are always going to have their requirements. So the construction related concerns, so you see a lot of construction, mm -hmm. um, you do see a lot of IT, mm -hmm. um, but it kind of falls back to what I said earlier, you never know what the government's going to look for mm -hmm. and how successful you're, you're going to be at doing it. The, the success of a business depends upon their, their own initiative, how they market themselves to the government, how they market themselves to other businesses. Mm -hmm. So it's important to understand that when it comes to government contracting, you have what's called a prime contractor who's actually winning the award, mm -hmm. and then subcontracting where you actually work for that prime contractor. So you know, being successful in whatever industry you're in mm -hmm. kind of depends on yourself. Sure. Yeah. So when you, um, you know, I do get a lot of uh, nascent companies or companies that are just starting up, mm -hmm. um, and they ask, oh, you know, is government contracting right for me? So right. I always have to kind of take a step back and say, you know, it really depends on the scope of work that you provide provide, but right. also uh, your work experience and sure. your work history. Mm -hmm. So would you advise a startup company or a company that's new to go into government contracting? For a new company or a company that's maybe less than a year old and maybe has limited resources because they are so new, mm -hmm. I would probably recommend subcontracting mm -hmm. as the way to start. Um, you have to understand that when you, when you put a lot of time and effort right. into submitting a proposal to the government, you know, you know say, 
The only thing worse than not winning a contract that you put that effort into mm -hmm. is winning a contract and then not being able to perform on it. Sure. So you win a contract, you can't perform, the chances of winning another contract are pretty much slim to none. Right. Right. So for those new companies that may not have the financial resources, the human capital resources, uh, bonding resources if that's required, then it may be better to go subcontracting. Right. So you have a piece of a larger contract and you know, your liability is not quite as great. Uh, could you kind of expand on the liability part for a, a subcontract as opposed sure. to a prime contract? Sure, so Just, um, when we deal with prime and subcontracting, the prime contractor is gonna have liability for the entire contract. Mm -hmm. So they're gonna be responsible to the government to make sure the work gets performed. Now the subcontractor is liable to the prime contractor for a portion of that work. Mm -hmm. Say if we're looking at a construction related type contract. Now, a large company who comes in and, and wins that contract is responsible for building the entire building and everything that's inside that building. Now, you're a smaller contract contractor and you have a subcontract of that larger contract. Say you're doing the electrical work mm -hmm. of that building. You're responsible for that electrical work and you're responsible to that prime contractor. Right. So your liability lies with the performance of work for that piece of that contract. Right. Whereas the prime contractor is liable for everything, right. including your work. So you want to make sure you do it well, regardless of whether you're a prime contractor or a subcontractor. Of course. And do you, um, as a subcontractor, um, do you fall under the umbrella of that prime contractor in terms of, uh, you know, bonding? You can. I okay. mean, there are some prime contractors who will allow subcontractors to kind of piggyback on their bonding. Mm -hmm. um, it's always a good idea for any kind of construction-related concern to have their own level of bonding, right? Because it just increases their their opportunities mm -hmm. that they can say we have our own bonding up to a certain dollar amount. Right. So it, it just it gives that assurance to both the government and the prime contractor okay. that you have the ability to perform. And if you don't, that there's some kind of insurance right. based upon. Um, so I get this. I get asked this question a lot, and maybe right. you uh, will have a better answer. But uh, what is the difference between insurance and bonding? Um, bonding, and, and again, we're not. I don't want to get too far involved in insurance and bonding because. Right. When we get involved, we get that question a lot as well. Right. So it's like, hey, how do I get bonding? Yeah. Like, eh, bonding may not be our cup of tea because bonding, you're getting into financial and, and information. We just know that there's requirement for sure. it. That you have a level of bonding, which is basically in terms to perform work. Right. Um, and then you have to speak to one of the local vendors who provide that bonding okay. and what their requirements are for right. it. If we, but all federal contracts do require... Uh, not contract. all federal contracts mm -hmm. require bonding. Typically, those contracts require... Are, around construction. Oh, construction. Terms, so, okay. Yeah. All right. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, you know, in your experience, and I know you kind of uh, touched upon this, but any industries that you really feel like, you know what, 2019, they're going to have, uh, you know, a lot of opportunities for mm -hmm. small businesses. Right. Just uh, because... Uh, yeah, I, I get that question a lot. Mm -hmm. um, it's like, hey, what's the government looking for? And typically when you know what the government's looking for, it's because it's a large dollar amount that they have planned in the past so they have a forecast for it like the army corps of engineers will have a forecast for their upcoming construction which they actually have online and there's actually some set asides just for small businesses and these contracts can range up to you know millions of dollars just for small businesses uh, navfac so you know these large construction related agencies right. are going to have these large construction related job opportunities coming up and the beauty about it is is that they publicize what it is that they, they have coming up right so even if you don't consider yourself a business that's going to win that prime contract. You just know thing, that it might come your way. Right, you know that there may be an opportunity to be a subcontractor sure. under that. So, and there's various ways to find out you know, who's been awarded contracts in the past, mm -hmm. who's interested in bidding on a contract, so that you as a smaller business can contact those larger businesses mm -hmm and say, hey, I'd be interested in subcontracting right. on this on this. And I guess that goes into uh, the marketing bit. And we'll talk mm -hmm. about that after our short break. Sure. Uh, so thanks. Yeah, thank you. All right. This is Think Tech Hawaii, raising public awareness. Freedom, is it a feeling? Is it a place? Is it an idea? At Dive Heart, we believe freedom is all of these and more, regardless of your ability. Dive Heart wants to help you escape the bonds of this world and defy gravity. Since 2001, Dive Heart has helped children, adults, and veterans of all abilities go where they have never gone before. Dive Heart has helped them transition to their new normal. Search DiveHeart.org and share our mission with others, and in the process, help people of all abilities imagine the possibilities in their lives.
Hello, I'm Yukari Kunisue. I'm your host of the new Japanese language show on Think Tech Hawaii called Konnichiwa Hawaii, broadcasting live every other Monday at 2 p.m. Please join us where we discuss important and useful information for the Japanese language community in Hawaii. The show will be all in Japanese. Hope you can join us every other Monday at 2 p.m. Right, welcome back to Adventures in Small Business. We have John Green, Program Manager for the Procurement Technical Assistance Center in Hawaii. Um, just continuing on what we were talking about, uh, you know, you were saying that uh, when you're looking for a contract or whether it's a prime or sub, you need to actually go out and market. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, marketing is prevalent everywhere, but mm -hmm. how does one market to the federal government? You have to know what the, the target audience is. Right? If you're a construction-related concern, you don't necessarily want to be marketing yourself to the Naples Supply Systems. They don't do construction. Or Defense Information Technology. You know, they don't do construction, or they do very limited construction, I should say. You want to know your audience. So if you were in that concern, you'd want to go to the Army Corps of Engineers, Naval Facilities Command Hawaii, Navy Facilities Command Pacific. Um, you want to know what agency is buying what you sell, whether it's construction, whatever industry you're in, you want to know who's buying it. The other way you can do market research is actually to research the awarded contracts. Mm -hmm. If you want to, say, pursue subcontracts, and you want to know what companies in the same industry as yourself have been winning these contracts. There's ways to look at publicly accessible information to say, oh, these companies, have, these local companies even, have been winning these contracts, and you want to market yourself to them. Mm -hmm. as, even though you may be a competitor, mm -hmm. you can still be viewed as a partner mm -hmm. uh, for further you know, future opportunities that, that may come along. So anytime that you look at a subcontracting opportunity, what it does is it allows that prime contractor to expand their reach and maybe go after a bigger contract and know that there's smaller businesses that are going to help them perform on it. So you have to know how to market yourself to them. Mm -hmm. And there's ways to do that. There's what's called capability statements where you basically, it's like a resume for your business on a, piece, you know, a couple pieces of paper. Right. Um, you can always attach that to an email mm -hmm. to a point of contact either with the government or with another prime contractor. And the beauty about the government is that these larger agencies, be it Naval Supply Systems, Army Corps of Engineers, Naval Facilities Command, whoever, they actually have small business specialists on staff mm -hmm. who advocate on behalf of small businesses to contracting officers. Right. So if the government has a requirement and they think there's no small business that can perform on it, the small business specialist can step in and say, hey, you know what? I know this local small businesses that can do this. Let's do some market research of our own. Mm -hmm. And then in your marketing as a business, right. You can reply to them and say, yes, I'm interested in bidding on this, and I am capable of performing on it. Right. So the government knows that you're there. Wow, that's great. And mm -hmm. it's really the government's, uh, it's, they're, pro they're proactive in actually seeking they are. small businesses. They are. There yeah. is a certain process they, they follow when they're trying to fulfill a requirement. Right. And one of those steps is that they will put out what's called a sources sought for mm -hmm. a contract. And what they're doing is they're doing their own market research and their due diligence to see what local it doesn't even have to be local, what businesses are out there that are interested in bidding on this because it's a short synopsis of what they're looking for. Right. And they're looking for those businesses that can respond. Mm -hmm. So in that light, they're also looking for businesses that may be service-disabled, veteran-owned small businesses, women-owned small businesses, um, other certifications that the government has a what's called a set-aside for. Right. And they try to reach certain goals. Mm -hmm. And if they can see that there's these type of businesses out there, they may be able to set it aside for that type of business. Uh, that's great because uh, that was actually my next question was you know can you talk a little bit about set aside and we sure. hear that comp we hear that um, the word in a government contract mm -hmm. and we talk about procurement right um, for those viewers maybe listening mm -hmm. what is a set aside so in the real world of government contracting when we're talking about hundreds of billions of dollars per year that the government spends the government has a requirement to spend at least twenty three percent of those contracting dollars on small businesses and you know it's twenty three percent nah whatever. 23% of <laughs> billions and billions of dollars right. is a lot of money. Yeah. So of that 23%, there's 5% for what are called 8A businesses, which are socio and economically disadvantaged small right. businesses. There's another 5% for women-owned small businesses and economically disadvantaged women-owned small businesses. There's 3% for service-disabled veteran-owned small businesses, and another 3% for what are called hub zone businesses, historically underutilized business zones. So that adds up to 16%. Right. So you get another 7% that's just total small business. Right. So even if you don't have one of those certifications, you're still eligible to compete for right. small businesses. So when we talk about set-asides, the government wants to see 
that they meet those goals. Right. They actually get graded by the SBA on how well they've met these goals you know, in past fiscal years. Right. So they want to see that they're meeting these you know, 5% for women-owned small businesses and 3% for service-able service -able veteran-owned small businesses, et cetera. So the government wants to know who's out there, mm -hmm. and they want to do that. And the beauty about it as well is if a, say you're talking about a large business and they win a large contract. Sure. The government's also going to have a requirement that there be a subcontracting plan in place, and that prime contractor is going to also have to look for these type of businesses to be subcontracted. Right. So if you can have one of these certifications, if you're eligible for it, I highly recommend getting it. Okay. You know, it's another prop, another opportunity that we can provide assistance with. So okay. definitely worth your time. So the, the four set asides. Correct. Okay. Mm -hmm. And uh, would you say one is better than the other? What'd you think? You or, know, it, it's it's hard. You obviously, two of them have five percent, sure, and two have three percent. Right. Now, there's nothing to say you can't have more than one. Right. Oh, so you so, can be multiple. You can absolutely. have multiple. Options. Absolutely. Okay. Right. So if you're a woman and a veteran, a service disabled right. veteran, you yeah. can obviously be a certified oh. woman-owned small business and a certified service disabled veteran-owned small business. Right. So you're just that more attractive to the government. Right. And then they can check you know, out their boxes. Yes, exactly. <laughs> so, um, yeah, it's it's to say that one is better than the other. Mm -hmm. Mm. Are there any kinds uh, of, I mean, when you were dealing with uh, government agencies mm -hmm. or prime contractors, or is there one more in demand in the state of Hawaii? What I've heard anecdotally is that HUBZone, mm -hmm. regardless of where it is, yeah. is a little bit more challenging for the government to meet. Oh, wow. Okay. And one of the reasons that may be the reason here is that when you talk about hub zones, which are, again, are historically underutilized business zones, the neighbor islands are hub zones, and you only have small pockets here on Oahu mm -hmm. that are determined to be hub zones. But the vast majority of contracting opportunities are here on Oahu. Right. So you have hub zone businesses on the neighbor islands, but opportunities here on Oahu. Yeah. So we have to make that connection. Yeah. So I think it's more important for, well, I hate to say the word important, mm -hmm. but maybe it's a higher preference for the government to look for those hub zone businesses to meet that 3% goal. Right. Because even though it's only 3%, there is a, a, a difficulty meeting that percentage. Yeah. So. And those patches are probably like in the North Shore or Guadalupe? Yeah, typically or? more in rural areas. Say, yeah, rural areas. Okay. Surprisingly, there may be some areas here in, in huh. relatively close to downtown Honolulu that are, okay. that are hub zone as well. But um, yeah, it's just getting those businesses that even are there. Mm -hmm. Uh, to register as a hub zone, right. if they are, because you do have to be registered as a hub zone business. And, and how does certified. one go about registering? I mean, is it just, uh, or even just being um, a set aside? I mean, mm -hmm. do you say, hey, you know what? I'm a woman. I'm a small business. I just, I certify myself. Is that sure. how it works? <laughs> um, there actually are, when you do register to do work for the government, mm -hmm. um, in that system for award management, you can self-certify. Otherwise known as SAM. Right? Otherwise known as SAM.gov. Right. Mm -hmm. You can self-certify as a service able veteran, a woman-owned small business, a minority-owned business. Um, but from a contracting officer's perspective, mm -hmm. I would like to see those businesses be certified by a third party, okay. whether it be the SBA mm -hmm. or the Department of Veterans Affairs, that assures me that not only are they woman-owned, but they're women-controlled. Because right. when we talk about a woman-owned small business or a service-able veteran-owned small business, we want to know that the woman and the service-able veteran are actually owning and controlling that business. Mm -hmm. So it's always better when a third party certifies it because they will look at all the information that validates that business and control. Right. So, so uh, talking about the, you kind of touch upon the uh, being service disabled, better on small business. Mm -hmm. um, what are the, I mean, when you're talking about the third party, you're talking about the Veterans Affairs. Correct. Okay. The Department of Veterans Affairs can certify them through what's called the Center for Verification and Eligibility mm -hmm. and that they would go through uh, and submit their application. Okay. Yeah. And how long does that application in a, general in a general term, if there's no issues with it, no questions, no mm -hmm. problems with it, we're talking about maybe four to six months, depending okay. upon the government's backlog okay. and the resources that they have available to review all the applications that come in. Right. If there are questions or there needs to be clarifying information on the application, it can take longer. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, again, we do provide assistance with the application process. So. If it's something they want to sit down with us, we can discuss it with them and okay. hopefully maybe expedite the process a little bit. Right. Yeah. So um, the VA certifications, it's not just just being certified by the VA. It's not, you can't, you can use that certification for other contracts outside of the VA as well. You can now. Okay. It, it used to be that there was two certifications for service-able veteran. There was okay. one done by the SBA right. and one do, done by the Department of Veterans Affairs. Mm -hmm. uh, they recently changed the, the regulations, so now the SBA is the governing 
regulation for both the Department of Veterans Affairs and the SBA, okay. of course. So prior to this change, which took effect, I believe, in October, um, if you were certified through the Department of Veterans Affairs, that applied to just the Department of Veterans Affairs. Right. If you were certified through the SBA, it applied to every other agency within the government. Right. Now, because they're both falling under the same rules, any, the certification that you get through the Department of Veterans Affairs applies to any agency within the government. So it doesn't really make sense to do two of them. You can no. just do it. Now you can just do one. One. Right. Okay. Yes. All right. Mm -hmm. That's great. Um, and in your experience, what are the biggest pitfalls in companies uh, when they go into contracting? The biggest pitfall I've seen is that businesses are so excited to, just for the opportunity to win a contract. Okay. And knowing that, they may actually underbid themselves. Mm -hmm. And the government understands that you're in business to make a profit. Businesses think that in order to be competitive, they have to eat into their own profit or even in drastic cases lose money because they want to get their foot in the door in right. government contracting. And that does nobody any good. Mm -hmm. I mean, you want to make sure that you understand the requirements that the government has out there and you bid it accordingly to what your prices are right. you know, or the other technical approaches to the, to the solicitation. So if, if the government sees something comes in and it, it may not be as in the ballpark of other bids that come in, they could just throw it out. They right. could ask for clarification, like why is your bid so low? Maybe they didn't understand it, but I've seen it where they put in a, a proposal and the price is just too low. Mm. And it's, it's because they want to win. They want to get in or right. get in. Uh, mm -hmm. So, um, but does a government agent, do government agencies generally choose the lowest bidder? Uh, on some contracts they will. There are what's called um, lowest price technically acceptable. Mm -hmm. uh, and then they have what's called best value. Okay. So price will always be a factor, right. but it may not be the only or most important factor. Mm -hmm. Typically when you get into larger type contracts, um, there'll be other factors involved, be it your technical approach to solving the government's problem, mm -hmm. the managerial approach, your past performance, right. how you've met these requirements in the past, uh, and price. So it, it plays a role based upon the type of contract that you're winning. Okay. So typically small businesses will get what's called firm fixed price contracts. Okay. And firm fixed price contracts are basically where the government knows their requirements. It's not murky. Everybody understands what the requirements are. So on a firm fixed price contract, the business submits their price, right. their cost. And the government says, oh, you're the lowest cost, you're meeting the requirements, and you win the contract. It, right? yeah. Wow. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you. Uh, you know, we could probably go on another hour talking about government contracts. We probably could. Yeah. yeah. But uh, we're kind of out of time. Yeah. Thank you, John, for uh, coming today. And no, thank you. Your thank uh, you. afternoon with us. I appreciate uh, it. This has been Adventures in Small Business. Uh, thank you for joining us and hope to see you soon.